Oh, one more thing, ladies and gentlemen, just a uh, museum note, if you will. If you've ever wondered what 30,000 people look like in a museum, you're experiencing it right now. We, between spring break and the middle of August when school starts, this is what the museum looks like day after day, week after week. 30,000 people in this place every day for six months. We are the most popular museum on planet Earth. About 9 million people visit us every year, and they have been doing that for 40 years. Right? Very cool. Now, welcome to a gallery, ladies and gentlemen, that is called the Wright Brothers and the Invention of the Aerial Age. If you're somebody that doesn't know much more about the Wright Brothers than they think they built bicycles, true, and they invented the airplane, also true. This is the gallery to get lost in for a very good hour. We talk about mom and dad, the family tree. Mom and dad Wright had four Wright sons plus a Wright daughter. In between, the, between Orville and Wilbur, the last two sons, they would have twins that would die in infancy. What others were doing in aviation before, during the Wright brothers, is the other side of the house. What the Wright brother, my friend, how you doing? And what the Wright brothers, their inventors, is their genius. How they figured out this thing called flight. That's the back wall. I'm echoing. I don't want you to do that. And then now that we've built this thing called the airplane and can fly it with impunity, what are we going to do with this thing now? That's the farthest wall away from us. It's a very cool gallery to get lost in for a very good hour. We of course don't have that time, so we're going to talk about the airplanes hanging in the room, but I always think it's fitting and proper, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce you to the main cast of characters of this room, and here they are. Now my question to you, ladies and gentlemen, is simple. One of those guys is Wilbur Wright, one of those guys is Orville. Who's who? Anybody want to hazard a guess? It's a 50-50 shot. <laughs> Pretty good odds if you're playing a lot of numbers. Think about it. Do you, you guys want to give it a shot? Who's who? Which one is Orville? Which one is Wilbur? Do you have any idea? You want to try? Wilbur's on the right. One more time, sir. What's the name, Wilbur? Okay. On the right. He, listen to Dad. He's right. No pun intended. Uh, this is Wilbur. This is horrible. 1867, 1871. Born in Indiana. Born in Ohio. On the strength of high school mathematics, they show him the most exotic math the Wright brothers used to invent that thing in the center. In other words, the airplane was high school trigonometry. Nothing special. So these guys were comfortable, middle-class, successful bachelors who had a thriving, booming business in the 1890s. And there is one of their things that they would do or use or sell in that booming business right there, that bicycle. In the Wright brothers' time, that is a Van Cleef. That would set you back 50 to $75 in their money. And today's money, ladies and gentlemen, that is an $1,800 bicycle. All right? So they were doing pretty good financially, but they were looking for something to intellectually stimulate themselves. They were bored. They wanted to do something to occupy their brain. And they heard about a guy named Otto Lilienthal, a German hang glider, who had built a hang glider, had it floated over in Germany, outside of Berlin, a little town called Potsdam, on a man-made hill there. He had flown this glider 2,000 times. Got to be really good at it. Something tragically happened. He got that thing turned over, and he crashed to his death. Died that evening. A small article in the Dayton paper about Lillian Thal's misfortune is what got the Wright Brothers started. I used to say got the Wright Brothers off the ground, but I heard too many groans from you guys, so I don't use that anymore. Anyway, this is what got the Wright started. I realized this, folks. When the Wright Brothers said, we're going to further the study of aviation, they weren't out to do what they ultimately did. They just wanted to add to the knowledge base. These guys did not know anything about flight other than birds can do it pretty good. That's all they knew. So who do they contact to get some book knowledge, to get some, get some things out of their belt to figure out what they're going to do, how we're going to do it? They didn't have the internet, of course, in the 1890s, but they did have the Smithsonian. And Wilbur writes a letter to the Smithsonian and says, we are not tinkers, we are not crockpots, we want, to study the we want to further the study of aviation. What have you got to get us started? And the Smithsonian would send him five books. The scope of knowledge the Smithsonian had at that time on flight. And those five books are in a case on the same wall as the houses. With book knowledge, watching the birds do what they do, they got busy. Let's walk to the other side of the airplane. Hey, look at this plane. Take a look at that plane. Man.
his airfoil to construct his wing and they built their first real airplane and that's the thing next to the kite that's 1900 it did not it did not do very well at all in flight and they realized when they dissected Lillian Foe's tables the tables he uses to construct an airfoil that one of the constants was off so they would fix that constant and they would build another airplane one year later but just about like that and it behaved better with nothing earth shattering then the Wright brothers did something that would change everything. And the thing they did was they discovered the wind tunnel. I'm not saying they invented it. They did. But they heard about it and said, we could use it for what we need. And they built the wind tunnel. And the rest, they say, is history. Look at the 1900 glider right there. 1900 glider, 1901. Look about the same. Read that as a short, stubby wing flying machine. Now look at the glider right above us, right over here in the corner. Notice the wing shape is vastly different. Short and stubby over there, long and skinny above. Long and skinny with one and out for the Wright brothers. And each year, 1900, 01, 02, 03, and 08, they would bring a flying machine down to the Outer Banks of North Carolina, about 40 miles south of the Virginia border, near a little town called Kitty Hawk, at a place called Kill Devil Hills. They would go down there when it was not bicycling weather. In other words, not in the spring, not in the summer. That is where they built their bikes and made their money to afford this uh, uh, investigation of flight. So they would go down there and they would bring a glider each year, different glider each year, learn from it, figure out it's working, it's not working, why, and so forth and so on. Each year they came back with a new machine. The first two couldn't hardly get on their own shadows, like I said, the 1902 glider above, they took it up on one of the sand dunes down there, one of them climbed on, the other two plus some helpers I'll talk about in a minute would throw the guy off the sand dune. This thing would fly for 600 feet at a stretch, two football fields effortlessly, easily. No big deal. When they realized we could do that with this, they realized success is assured. So once the 1902 flying scene is over, they would hurry home and build the airplane here in the center. Now, the height. The two gliders above Lee Shaman, if the right brothers were standing among us, they would no doubt recognize these three things for what they are. The Lee Shaman, the three things hanging above, the right brothers have never seen. These three things were built special for the exhibition. They're maybe 14 or 15 year olds old if they're a day. When the right brothers finished with these three things way back when they were left behind because they considered the research goals not worthy of saving. Not so the thing here in the center. The thing here in the center is a 1903 Wright Brothers Flyer. This is the first heavier than air man controlled power sustainable flying machine to fly. It was this airplane that you guys I just introduced you to on the porch which changed the world we live in today in this very machine. This is the airplane, ladies and gentlemen, that starts it all right in front of me. It is a cold ride right December morning on the 17th of December 1903. The two brothers get up, get dressed like you see them, have some breakfast. One of them goes outside and puts on one of the two buildings they occupied, one for them, one for the airplane, a big red bed sheet. This big red bed sheet alerts these guys right here. These guys are United States Life Saving Station members. And essentially, ladies and gentlemen, if you're in a boat and you're in distress, these are the guys who are going to risk their life for them to rescue your life for them. When they're not doing what they're paid for, these are the right brothers' rap group. So these guys come catching up the beach and help the brothers move this airplane from the hangar onto the runway. Notice the two by four you see lying along the bottom. That is the runway of this machine. Now, 
We are trying to show beach sand here, ladies and gentlemen. So, they got the airplane sitting on the runway, and a couple of days earlier, on December 14th, they had tried the first time with Will around the controls. He didn't do so good. Damaged the airplane, and that's why they're going on the 17th. So we were having tried three days earlier and failed. It's now Orville's turn. Remember the guy who has the mustache? It is which one? Orville, right? So, Orville climbs onto the wing. They fire the engine up. Wait for the right pitch. When he hears that right pitch, he releases the spring. The airplane runs down the runway, two thirds, three quarters of the way down. Orville hogs back on the stick with his hand, left hand like you see him there and the airplane will stagger off into the air. It will cover 120 feet in 12 seconds and settle back on the wheel. Let me get over here. Get no, I just want to make sure I'm not talking behind anybody, that's all. all right. So, first flight with Orville, 120 feet long, 12 seconds in the air, and he settles onto the beach. Man's first control power sustainable flight has just occurred. The world will never be the same again. They bring the airplane back, it's Wilbur's turn. He will fly it a little bit farther than Brother Orville just did. Time and distance. Third flight, Orville second. He will fly it a little bit farther than Brother Wilbur just did. If they stop flying the airplane after the third flight, what they did today would be right for debate. Did they fly far enough? Well, how far do you consider a flight? All sorts of debating points come to mind. But then Wilbur takes his airplane off the fourth flight. And he takes the flight the third flight. He flies, he flies, he flies some more. He will be in the air, ladies and gentlemen, the fourth flight of this airplane. Will we're second? 59 seconds. He will be, he will cover 852 feet of distance before he settles back onto the beach. Now, think about this. Five years of effort, eight years of time, and they have found success. Now, Wilbur's not paying attention to the big picture because you must be one with this machine. Your mind can't wander. So he's not paying attention to what he's, he's not paying attention to the big picture. He's paying attention to flying the airplane. But all those seeing him disappear down the beach. The ground crew is seeing him do the same thing. So by the time he gets stopped, Orville and the ground crew are right at his side. And depending on who you're made up, there are two scenarios. Scenario number one, that's about 12.30 in the afternoon. It's one time, not, not lunch. The other time I've heard is they had a celebration. They forgot all about the airplane. The 1903 equivalent of high fives, that's not a thing at all around. It doesn't matter which story you believe. What is true, they ignored the airplane for the wrong time, not the wrong time. Because if a gust of wind comes up, it was the airplane end over end, tail over tail, bouncing it down the beach. All right, so they look at the airplane after they have got to stop. The fabric and wood have been broken or ripped. It's a big deal, we can fix that, that's not a big deal. They could not fix the engine's damage with a limited amount of repair along the outer bank. So what do they do? They secure the airplane. Rover walks the four miles up to the nearest town, getting off. Now let me ask you this, ladies and gentlemen. What is the 1903 equivalent of a message you would send with this thing? Telegram, of course. Success, four flights through the home press with the four press, Rover right. Now these two guys are a lifelong match, which they would never marry. The older two brothers of the Wright brothers, Rachel and Warren, they were the ones who married and had the children whose descendants are still around today. So the descendants of the Wright brothers, Orville and Wilbur, are grand-nephews. Right. The youngest child that was mom and dad right had, her name was Catherine. She married late life and died a few years after marriage or whatever it was. So she never had children. So the older two brothers that are starting the family tree to this day. So their family men, they want to be home for the holidays, which they do. They create, they create everything in the into crates that they've shipped out there in and ship it home. Ladies and gentlemen, this airplane in front of you will never fly again. Auto flight time of this machine in front of you, ladies and gentlemen, is just two minutes. 1,300 feet distance flow. Give me an idea what 1,300 feet is. That weighs six blocks as the U.S. Capitol Dome. And third in that distance between us and it, is that 1,300 feet. Their engineering problems is so good, they know the problem with this airplane's design and will fix it the next year. First airplane, 1904 airplane, do a left to right turn to a figure eight in the air. Not what they were after, ultimately. What they were ultimately after from the very beginning is to build an airplane of practical utility. 
What is the right? What does that mean to the right brothers? That means to the right brothers, you build an airplane and fly it in a half hour, 25 miles. Man the machine, put more gas in the tank, fly another 25 miles in another half hour. That's their definition of practicality. Ladies and gentlemen, two years after that, they built the 1905 airplane, world's first practical airplane. When they realized they could fly the 05 flyer with impunity, they stopped flying coal for two and one half years to wait for a patent they applied for the 1902 glider's control system to be granted. Once the patent is granted, they would build another airplane calling it the Model A. Wilbur would take a Model A to Europe and spend a year over there. When he gets over there, he is scorned and ridiculed, especially by the French because they're very aeronautical. <clears throat> but then a year after he gets over there, he is considered a rock star. Orville stays here in the United States and does essentially what his Wilbur is doing over there, here in the States, essentially trying to sell the airplane to governments. They are both successful. Beginning in 1910, they have opened a factory. You can go to the factory, sit across from somebody who would gladly take your money, which is $5,000 in their world, $100,000 an hour. And they will write up a contract. They will build you an airplane, assign you to somebody who will teach you how to fly, which takes a week. And perhaps the whole factory, when you when you have satisfied your instructor, will wave bye bye to you as you fly your newfound purchase away. All right. They are an airplane that did essentially that. With what I mentioned in 1910 is our next major stop. Any questions before we press on, ladies and gentlemen? All right. I've got one more cool thing to show you in this room, and it is arguably one of the coolest things you will see in your visit to this building right this way.
Thank you.